one day and he said, guess what? You get to play little league baseball. And I just, I remember that moment, like it was yesterday. And, um, that was clearly the, uh, a pivotal, pivotal moment in my life. And so I played little league baseball. I was the only girl on my team and I was probably the best player on my team. <laughs> There's nobody here to argue with me about that. So, um, and I would say eight to 11 year old boys who had never played sports with girls before were just brutal. They, I mean, I just have some memories of how, how mean they were to me, um, at least initially. And then I had a coach who had my back and he's like, I wish I had eight other players like her. Cause you know, she's a good first baseman and pitcher. And, and he really helped um, welcome me to the team team and and settle the boys down who thought this was going to be the end of the world to have a girl play baseball with them so um after a couple of years playing baseball I, uh, all my friends were playing softball they started a softball team in my hometown and so I decided to switch over and play softball with my with my friends which kind of was the end of my ambition to be the first woman major league baseball player but I probably had some other limitations there as well but um so that uh, launched me in a, a lifetime and love of sports and um, ended up getting into working in athletics kind of kind of by accident. But uh, but 20 years ago this month, I came to Iowa State and um, with my husband and we had three little ones at the time um, and they grew up in Ames. My, my daughter ended up um, playing basketball for the Naval Academy and is a naval officer at the Pentagon. And so she also did some groundbreaking uh, in a, a more male dominated industry. So I'm really proud to, to have the next generation um, kind of pushing through with those barriers. So I'm sure we'll, we'll talk more, but that's a long story. We'll dive life. in, we'll <laughs> dive in. Thank you, Kelly. So. Cindy. I think so. Uh, my name is Cindy Fredrickson, uh, and I retired from Iowa State from the kinesiology department after about 35 years uh, working in the department uh, alongside Jan Barron and Shirley Wood and Barbara Forker and, and some of those people. I uh, had a wonderful career and a wonderful opportunity and a wonderful opportunity to be around a lot of athletes and healthy people. And it, it was a wonderful experience working with that power as well. I started at Iowa State, uh, my undergraduate degree in 1968. And I think Reed and I were probably in a class or two together. Didn't you start in 68, Reed? 69. Oh, I'm older than you, thanks. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, so I started in 68. I, I had played golf ever since I was five years old. Uh, my parents were golfers, so I enjoyed the game a, a lot. Um, Iowa was a wonderful place to play golf when you were a young girl, because they had a, uh, the Iowa Women's Golf Association had a great junior program and probably still does. And so I played in junior golf programs, uh, state tournaments that they sponsored ever since I was 12 years old uh, and met Lynn Sandeman, who we played together. She was from Crest and I was from Marshalltown. We played years and years and years together um, and uh, ended up going the same track. She came to Iowa State as well. So uh, I played uh, high school golf. Uh, golf and tennis were the first sports, obviously, that uh, other than basketball for small schools in the state of Iowa, the larger schools didn't have anything for women. We complained enough until they started a golf program in 1966. So I was on the first high school uh, Bobcat golf team. Uh, and we were able to go on and, and have um, tournaments uh, with surrounding schools and then a state tournament as well. Uh, so then when I got to Iowa State in 68, there was no golf team. Uh, I continued to play golf, but there was no golf team. Uh, Barbara Forker, in her wisdom, she saw what was coming through the pike, through AFERD, which is the PE Alliance, the professional alliance, uh, in the late 50s started uh, a subcommittee, DGWS, a Division of Girls and Women's Sports, which went on to create um, AIAW, the uh, 
Association for, uh, see, <laughs> I always get mixed up on this. Uh, the Association for uh, Intercollegiate Athletics for Women, AIAW. It started, it took effect in, in 71 as an organization. Barbara Forker knew that it was coming. So in, in 1970, she hired Joan Gerhardt, who was the first uh, golf coach. We had a meeting in that fall. She put it in the daily, the Iowa State Daily, saying, hey, if you'd like to play uh, golf, you want to try out for the golf team, uh, come and join up. So we fielded our first team in the spring of 1971. Uh, because of Iowa's uh, junior golf program, we had wonderful success in the in the meets that we had we traveled i uh, was able to go to uh, a national golf championship in las cruces new mexico uh on my own dime uh, the way we were funded was was really uh, through a, a little contribution from the physical education for women department gsb charlie herberg uh, he was a, on a subcommittee trying to promote women's sports, so he talked GSB into giving us some money. Uh, and uh, I think maybe even by the last year, the university kicked in just a little bit of money. So I was able to play 71 through 73. Uh, and, prop, and AIAW was that precursor of the voices over the cumulative years. Uh, from the 1900s, women like sport. Women competed. They wanted to. They wanted to continue. They looked for opportunity. They pressed for opportunity. And it's through those voices that in 1972, uh, Title IX responded finally to those voices. And AIAW filled a gap uh, until NCAA kind of filled in and decided women's sports could generate money. So that's my relationship to the panel. I was pre-Title pre IX. But the movement start started a long time ago, and the voice continued until it happened. So that's my background. Oh, and I'm long. We're almost done. We're almost done. <laughs> I'll, I'll wrap it up for us, okay? <laughs> I'm Elaine Heber, and uh, I'm probably the trailblazer of this group. I paved the way for many young girls and women to compete in athletics. Uh, when I started, I started. Uh, my undergraduate was in physical education. My master's was in administration. There wasn't any such thing as sport management. You didn't let girls do that. Uh, I then, <clears throat> excuse me, I then went on to coach or to teach in uh, at a high school for five years, where I also coached five sports and directed the intramural program for the girls, junior high and high school. Uh, in 1972, Title IX was part of was passed as part of the Educational Amendment Act. It wasn't implemented until 1975, which then required that equity must be achieved for girls and boys, men and women in athletics. Well, at the time in 1975, it just finally dawned on the men, oh my God, what are we gonna do? We've got to hire a woman. So I was that woman at Miami University and I was to start the women's athletic program at Miami. I was the only full-time person, administrator. I coached six teams, uh, volleyball, basketball, softball, uh, JV, and varsity. I never worried about an overlap in the sports season because we only had one set of uniforms. Uh, my advantage, I learned how to do everything. I drove the van, I packed the lunches, um, I did the laundry. I'm proud to say that I added an accent color to the Miami red and white, uh, <laughs> pink. Um, I drove the van, I set up the gym, I hired the officials, I did all the schedules, and we had part-time coaches. Uh, I quickly realized having 15 sports wasn't going to go very well. Oh, I forgot to tell you, I had a $17,000 budget. Um, I realized that basketball would be the trailblazer, that that's a sport that men could understand and relate to. So the next year, we were fortunate to hire a full-time basketball coach who also coached uh, softball. I then switched to volleyball and tennis. Um, we eventually evolved, and I, we'll talk about AIW later on, but it was a most interesting time for, for women in athletics. 
After five years at, I at Miami, uh, we were up to a $500,000 budget. We had three full-time coaches. We had a graduate assistant in sports information, and we um, were down to uh, eight sports, which we could manage and compete in. Uh, Iowa State recruited me in 1979 to merge, help merge the men and women's athletic programs. So I came here as kind of the merger baby to help make that adjustment because at that time they were still separate in terms of women's athletics, which you know was just booming at the time. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I came at that point and I worked with men and women's athletics. Uh, it was an adjustment. I was never well received wherever I went. And that was just something that happened. And they gradually, the men gradually accepted me because they realized if I did well, got something great for the men, women swimming, the men's swimming team was going to get similar uh, support. So that, that paid off. And my career then grew from there in terms of opportunity. Being a trailblazer, I was one of the few women on the campus that had administrative background. So I worked on, I was served on many, many committees, many because of Reed Crawford, who was wonderful as a mentor and a support to me. But I had the exposure of serving on uh, presidential search committees, provost search committees. I was on some of the major committees because I was one of the few women at that time. My opportunities also expanded to the Big 8, Big 12, NCAA, because we were emerging at that point. So my experiences were fabulous and my exposures were wonderful. Uh, the opportunities I had, I'm, I'm very grateful for. So as a trailblazer, I'm thrilled to see where we are today, but we have so much more to do. And we will get to that, Lindsay. We will, we will. Um, let's, let's step back, uh, maybe we'll come back to athletics, let's say that, because there's a lot of things that Title IX have done as access and opportunity for women in education. And what would be some of, and I'll just, this will be open participation, what would be some of the things that you have personally or professionally experienced from an education of the access and opportunities as a reflection to Title IX? Anybody want to start? I would just like to- uh, Microphone. Yeah. Um, if schools were not in compliance with Title IX, then they were denied federal support. And I think that's where the teeth really came. For instance, if AIM schools did not have equality in education, in sports, then the federal money they get for any programs like school lunch could be denied. I think that's where the teeth of the uh, Title IX legislation came. Yes. And uh, while schools are not in compliance with it, it still has had impact. Absolutely. And I want to point out, I was never part of an athletic program administratively or anything at Iowa State because the Department of Health and Physical Education and what is now Department of Kinesiology was separate from the athletic department. Many people think otherwise, but uh, that's the case. No, I think that's so helpful to even walk through because there is a lot of misinformation. And one of the things that uh, we've had previous discussion about is just Title IX opening the door for women in multiple professions uh, to become doctors, lawyers, veterinary medicine, um, military academies started welcoming women. Um, what other experiences would you guys like to share? My husband's retired from uh, veterinary medicine. The enrollment of women in veterinary medicine is right at 90%. Wow. I think I would add a couple of things. Um, Title IX. Opened up schools opened up so many opportunities, not just in athletics. Frankly, everybody thinks of Title IX or Title IX as only in athletics. Title IX, there are only two pages devoted to athletics in the entire Educational Amendment Act. Those two, however, those two have generated over 20 lawsuits where all the other elements of Title IX really don't generate that many lawsuits. Uh, Title IX opened the door for so many in athletics, in education, police force, firemen, 
Uh, one of the bigger issues that keeps being overlooked is that it meant women could no longer be fired because they were pregnant. It provided for maternity leave, which is huge. It's a great opportunity. But even though it opened up opportunities in all of these areas, such as law, Sandra Day O'Connor graduated with a law degree. She was a clerk to an attorney for many, many years before they finally allowed her to become an attorney. And she didn't end up so badly, so. <laughs> Well, we can keep moving on. I think it is important, though, to recognize, um, Jan, you pointed out how legislation really started taking effect when the federal funding became um, the, the stopping point, that if you were not in compliant compliance, that that would prevent you from maybe having resources that otherwise would be. Um, as we continue on, you will we'll jump maybe to a timeline here, and we can focus some of the discussion on sports because of all of your experiences, but also what it has meant to uh, women in sports today. So just again, some of the, the different, um, I don't wanna say this is not inclusive by any means, but I think just recognizing the timeline earlier before we started, Cindy, you had talked about how the movement is not driven by legislation. It's the work that goes in before that. Would you mind expanding a little bit more on, on when you came to Iowa State and then also how that transition and, and as you played for AIAW, how that organization really spearheaded maybe some of the movement that went into Title IX for women. Uh, yeah, uh, like I said, the, the state of Iowa was pretty progressive as far as women's athletics compared to a lot of other states. Uh, so women's basketball starting in the 1920s uh, and, and even probably earlier than that. I, I, 1890, yes. Uh, I don't know if, if any of you had come to the library and saw that nice sequence on the uh, wall just as you come in. It was up a couple weeks ago. It must have been the uh, Ames History Museum that was part of that. Susan, Jen, uh, was uh, the um, Ames History Museum part of the, the, the work out in the hallway? Anyway, she not listen. Uh, but there was nice. There was a nice uh, Title IX set of six or eight, and it was a historical look at sport in Ames, women's sport in Ames. Did anybody see it? Is it over to the Ames uh, History Museum now? No, it was actually something um, the library's intern worked on as part of the Title IX celebration this year. So she did work with the Ames History Museum on locating some of those images. Oh, well, it was beautifully done, and it showed early 1900s that sport uh, and organized sport playing other towns in the vicinity. Uh, it was displayed. It was really nicely done, and I hope they bring it back sometime and put it back up. Because well, was... we did save it. <laughs> oh, so, good. So it's surely something we could revisit. Uh, but anyway, uh, in, in the 20s, 1920s, I think uh, uh, the Iowa Girls High School Athletic Union got started. Uh, so that sport could continue. And at that time, can you use your microphone, please, Jan? Uh, Iowa girls had been competing in basketball, as I said, in the small towns uh, three years after basketball was invented, so before 1900. And in my book, there are pictures of Iowa women playing. Um, also, uh, women had been advocating for years before AIW and so forth. In fact, one of them was Carrie Chapman Catt. And when she was here, there were no sports for women, but a few people were playing tennis and co-ed tennis and golf. Uh, she wanted to have some kind of physical activity for women. So she was the um, organizer, initiator, of a women's drill team. The men had ROTC and the women did not have anything. So she went to the commandant of the uh, military program and said, we women want to have activity. So they started a drill team. We would know it as a marching group, I guess. And the, uh, they were invited to perform at the Chicago World's Fair. And they went to the, um, regents, I guess, 
and the regents appropriated money for them to go and perform. They were one of the one of the rages of that World's Fair. Does anybody remember the year, maybe 1903? She wasn't a student anymore, but it continued. Well, as it began at Iowa State, um, Barbara Parker ha had the inside track on AFERD and what they were what, what they were hoping to introduce as uh, AIAW was to begin in 1971. Uh, she had organized so that we had uh, a, a, a coach, paid coach. Um, we had a budget of uh, probably twelve hundred dollars at at the very very most uh, to 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 travel to play to uh, enjoy. It was administered um, through a group called WISA, Women's Intercollegiate Sports Association, which was a council here on the Iowa State campus that had several faculty from physical education uh, and a team representative from each of the teams that were, were um, at that time active. So WISA kind of regulated uh, activities here and, 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 and the budgetary process. So um, that beginning kind of gave a, a good solid groundwork so that the right things were done with money being accounted for, with the university buying into it slowly because it was well-regulated uh, from, from uh, Dr. Forker's early guidance. And then as AIAW, we, we participated in a lot of different championships uh, under the guise of AIAW. I think softball came on board, uh, uh, tennis started at the same time golf did. So more and more Iowa State sports were added. Elaine, when you were first here, it was AIAW. And then when did it transition to uh, NCAA? Do you remember? Well, AIAW uh, started in 1971, and Iowa State was a charter member of the AIAW. AIAW is very interesting. You competed by state, and all of the schools within that state competed. Uh, in Ohio, we competed with uh, Ohio State, Northern Ohio, Cedarville, if y'all know Cedarville, Wittenberg, uh, Oberlin. Ohio State killed everybody in tennis. Uh, Mount St. Joseph College killed everybody in volleyball. So uh, it was across the board. It wasn't by division. It wasn't by major and minor. Everybody competed. Then at the state competition, whoever won in a sport advanced to the regional competition. And the regional competition uh, for Iowa included uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Nebraska. So that was your regional competition. It wasn't a Big 12 conference where you went from one coast to the next coast. It was a consolidated group, which really made a lot of sense. AIW did not permit recruiting. We had no scholarships. So it was a very different situation. In 1982, the NCAA realized they didn't have any control over women's programming. And at the time, what they did is they implemented a lot of rules and regulations. And where we used to have a very large basketball tournament, the National Basketball Tournament for Women, conducted by the NCAA, was 16 teams for the entire country. It took us almost 10 years to get up to 32. So uh, as much as people think NCAA helped grow women's athletics, NCAA helped in spite of, of themselves growing women's athletics. It took them 35 years to provide equity in the NCAA basketball championships. And that was happening just this year where the women's games were now March Madness and Final Four. Up until this year, we couldn't use that logo. That was more than you wanted to know. Well, let's also uh, maybe step back to some of the life skills that are developed through sport. Maybe you can speak to any personal experiences that you have, but as we see women's opportunities increase, what are some of the additional elements that each of you have grown through um, that helps inspire maybe your professional career that you either participated in or was able to take part in? Is it a loaded question? Hard one. Hard one. Yeah. I mean, things that I think about, confidence, 
you know, opportunities to use your voice. Um, this is an area that I guess I spend a lot of time in. I know Molly does as well. Um, and, you know, just being able to see how when you are practicing through and you're learning through a sport, you're developing so many additional skills that that will be able to take you forward in life. And so just being able to witness that in young people today, but also what are your experiences that helped you to be successful in life from sport? I'm not going to give a personal example, but I'm going to give an example all of you will know about. Um, years ago, I did a survey among the members of the Iowa Girls uh, Basketball Hall of Fame, and I reported it and published a paper. And I was talking with Lynn Pullman, the director of the Brunier Gallery, about that. And she said, I learned so much from playing basketball. And she went on to talk about how that playing basketball helped her develop the attributes as, that have made her such a fine leader. So one of the things that I think was really important that we discovered in the last 10 years, the letter winners that Iowa State has our softball team lost track of each other for about 40 years. And out of working with the letter winners and Google, God love Google, um, we started tracking down old teammates of the 1970s. And I think it really brought a closeness as well as this teamwork um, back into focus. And we have... You know, everybody raised their kids and their grandkids, and now it's we're all in our 60s and 70s and having a good time. And we're really enjoying each other's company again. And Lindsay and the letter winners has just kind of brought together the whole team of the 1970s, all of us old, old broads that didn't have any... Um, we just wanted to play softball back then, you know? We didn't really have any big goals. We really didn't necessarily see Title IX coming at us. We just wanted to play softball and have fun. And the the um, letter winners, and we, we developed a wonderful, redeveloped a wonderful friendship and teamwork um, of our softball, softball group, so. Well, before the panel got started, you had talked about um, sharing uniforms. Maybe we could walk through some of the, or problem solving. You know, I'm just going to kind of drop a few words in here, but how did you guys do that at the time when you were competing and building a softball program at Iowa well, State? Well, first of all, I was like in the third year of the softball. We had still with no scholarships and really no recognition. In the Iowa State Daily, we'd get a little blurb. Uh, winning a double header, we'd get like one paragraph saying who the winning pitcher was and what the score was. I mean, it was just, we had got absolutely no recognition, but um, by the third year, we actually had a paid coach, which was kind of cool. Um, and um, we shared the same uniform as the volleyball team volleyball team got the soft, got the uniforms during the winter and then they turned them over to us in the spring and the softball team got the spring it was a good look for us you know <laughs> we had an old uh backstop that was up by the forker building now it's a soccer field but it was a wooden backstop we've got this team picture somewhere and it just the the we played with what we had, you know, we had, I was a catcher and I had a chest protector and a mask, no shin guards, no elbow, you know, it was just no helmets back then. And you just kind of worked with what you had. We knew more about softball probably than the coach. I think the coach read about it in a book and then she came out on the field and started telling us how we were going to play softball. We came in second in the whole state, you know, so we did okay. But it was it was a really interesting time. But the, the teamwork, uh, that really, 
um, uh, we stuck together as a team and it still is very apparent. We really love each other's company. And what are some of those experiences that then you were able to take into nursing? Well, again, uh, teamwork, working with each other and, and, you know, relying on each other, uh, delegating out or accepting responsibility, that kind of stuff was really important that, um, uh, but working as a team, you know, when a bad trauma came in, everybody just had their little assignments and off we go. And that, that was probably, um, probably one of the bigger things that I learned. And maybe I'll, I'll tap into adversity, you know, how, how you're able to work through adversity with sport and how that prepares you for life. What were some of your experiences to that? I didn't have any adversity. I just had a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> Sounds like like I should have played golf <laughs> instead of soccer. <laughs> uh, uh, with, uh, some uh, opportunities were created through travel. When when you're playing golf, it's kind of a different type of sport because you spend four to five hours with people from other areas of the country, and you're you're walking the fairways together and it's not like you can't talk to that other person because they're the the opponent you you are meeting people we we traveled to indiana ohio minnesota uh, uh wisconsin uh nebraska missouri um and like i said las cruces new mexico and i met people that i talked with and enjoyed and would see at another tournament uh, or maybe play with the next day so uh it's all of these um opportunities to travel and see different courses and experience different people and see different things. Uh, and that's the part that sticks with me yet today and how much fun that was with my teammates, but also with all of the people that I met along the way, Nancy Lopez, I met, and that might be a name that you know from golf, uh, along the way. Uh, there, there were some great Val Skinner, she was on the tour for a while. Uh, so it was an opportunity. You learn to be organized. Uh, I learned to be healthy. Uh, I, uh, it, it, sport, sport can do so many different things. All of us, it's a personal definition of what it does for you, but there's so much there. Um, I didn't experience any adversity, and I still don't on the golf course because I just don't count those shots. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so then how has that um, how did your experience then support your professional um, aspirations? Because you worked at Iowa State for quite a while. Well, I was an academic advisor, and you need to be able to talk to people quite a bit. So, But I didn't have any problem with that, even coming to college. <laughs> and I learned even more and more about how to talk to people and enjoy different kinds of people. So uh, that was always um, a plus for my job, I guess, and uh, an understanding of sport and physical activity and health um, being important to me. I could pass that along to the students that were looking for a career uh, in that area. So it was very enjoyable. So the exposure, you know, to other people and being able to work with other people in collaboration and, and all of those kinds of skills. What else? I do want to say uh, our big trip was not Indiana or Las Cruces. If we had a big trip, it was like Luther College. You know, I don't think we ever went out of state. Um, and so the closeness of being in a van with people, uh, you learned a lot of idiosyncrasies and how to <laughs> deal with, with, with them. But uh, yeah, I just, I'm listening and I'm jealous because you know, uh, uh, we played Grandview a lot because they were like a 30 minute trip down the, down the street and uh, Iowa City, Luther, woo woo, we get, maybe got to spend the night, you know, with a $2 uh, stipend for food. We, we've talked to you traveling with six golfers versus 20 players. <laughs> sure. yeah. We've talked a lot about budgets too. <laughs> You know, bake sales, maybe yeah. that were earlier. Those are some years, some stories that I've heard. The the, the initial, um, the very first team, they recruited by going up and down the halls at the dormitories and asked for people, asked for uh, girls that had played high school softball. Uh, they also 
had uh, a bake sale so they could buy their own reversible shirt, which is what they wore as their uniform. Reversible shirts and bell-bottom jeans. That was the official Iowa State uniform in those years. They recruited by um, uh, putting ads in the, uh, the daily uh, for anybody that knew how to play softball to please come show up at the field. Um, it, yeah, it, it, times were just different then. It was fun. It was you had to be creative. It was a lot of um, mix and match, and it was just an interesting time. So, let's hear from Elaine about what she developed in athletics. Sure. So I think even just when we're thinking about budgets and we're thinking about access and opportunities, um, AIAW, NCAA, how did those things evolve, and and when did you start noticing change? Well, I noticed change right away. Um, that was easy to notice. Uh, any improvement was a change for us. Uh, I, I noticed opportunities right away. We we had adversity. When I first started here, we didn't get, uh, we had to wait for the men to finish practice in the swimming pool. We had to wait for the men to finish practice in basketball. We didn't have training table. Um, we didn't have textbooks. We didn't have academic advisors. So those changes came gradually. We improved our, our travel budgets. Uh, I used to know every McDonald's on um, Highway 30, 35, uh, anywhere we went, Highway Interstate 80, you had to know where the McDonald's were. The changes we experienced were wonderful. We were able to at least get training table for the women during their season for volleyball and basketball. They no longer had to get that hot plate, which you know how good they are at eight o'clock at night. Um, so those changes came. We started with being able to recruit. We improved our equipment. Uh, I know I upset the equipment manager when I said we needed uh, sports bras for the women. Well, that caused the AD to almost pass out. <laughs> now, keep in mind, the man had all of his practice clothes and athletic supporting equipment, et cetera. So, and sport bras were important. That doesn't make sense that, you know, think, oh, geez, well, of course, no. So we got samples so that I gave them to various uh, players as well as coaches so they could assess which one was the best sport bra. So by golly, we got sport bras. Those are little changes. We, we've made so many great strides at this point. Um, I, I think the adversity comes in in many ways. Those challenges, those things that you have to do on your own, um, not getting to start. That's a big, big challenge for many individuals. Sitting on the bench, but being a good practice player, that teaches a lot. And you also learn self-esteem, discipline, uh, courage. I had to have a lot of courage in my life. I realized very quickly that I couldn't break down those brick walls. I knew how to find my way around those brick walls. And you just learn to make do with what you have and, and then continue to develop and expose those opportunities. We're, we're very, very far away from equity still, but we've made a lot of progress. We now have over six generations of women who've experienced Title IX in their lifetimes. We have a wide opportunity to experience many, many more female coaches in athletics. And that's where we need to start to talk. And we're going to get there. So um, as we as we pro uh, project to the second half of this uh, panel and presentation today, we're going to go into some of those 13 program areas and then some recommendations and continue moving through um, where we are today. So we'll take a little bit of a break. And then we'll come back in about 10 minutes. We've got some coffee, some lemonade, and some cookies to share with you all today. So we'll be right back.
You know, we definitely um, sent them the press I, I, I think that's where I left it on the bed of Like some of you And she can speak to them as a letter that is yeah. the value. Yeah. I am induction. There's a home for this. Every inductee. Thanks. Well, and just think as well. Oh, if everyone could start heading back to their seats, we can get started for the second half. We have everyone go ahead and head back to their seats and we'll get started for the second half. Thank you. <laughs> They're not so much interested in stopping. <laughs> okay. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started here for the next part of our presentation. So we'll ask everybody to come back forward. <laughs> 
this is what it's all about is creating community and sharing stories. That's why we're here today, which I love. And the cookies, I guess the cookies definitely brought some, a, a great addition to those that are in person. Um, so as we get started uh, here, kind of the second portion of the panel, um, wanted to talk through 13 program components of Title IX. We don't have enough time to go into detail on all of these. However, I would like to open discussion around some of the following topics, and I can always prompt back to where we are, but participation numbers, facilities, practice times, medical care, and academic support, and how some of those areas have increased over the years. And Callie, if we could start with you and then open up with additional reflections and experiences, what are, and you can even pick one topic if you want to start okay. with. All so right. I'll let you choose. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I like to go back a little bit, I mean, uh, and talk about um, one of the unintended consequences of Title IX. I mean, one of the, the best things that Title IX did, which is you can't argue with uh, the participation opportunities for girls and women, and it exploded, and that's fabulous. Um, but what has declined since Title IX are the number of female coaches and female administrators. Those became lucrative positions, they pay well, and I know that um, uh, Elaine alluded to that in, in early remarks about um, about the lack of of females coaching coaching women, but the coaching aspect of this thirteen program components is is not about the gender of the coach; it's about the quality of the coach. So, you reference the the coach that read a book and showed up and tried to coach the team. Well, now we we have to make sure that they have quality coaching and that that level of coach is available to both our men and our women. Um, I think we've done a, a fabulous job at Iowa State in, in, in many of those areas. Uh, we use the, the, um, the participation prong of the three-part test to achieve our, our compliance. Uh, the student body population at Iowa State is roughly 55% men, 45% women, and we are within tenths of percentage points of that ratio in our athletics program. So by meeting that, we, we, we meet the prong of measuring our compliance with Title IX. Athletic scholarships in my 20 years, we have hit the mark. So the number of the percentage of athletic scholarship has to be proportional to your number of women and men in your athletics program. Um, if, you, if you're paying attention, you see what kind of equipment and supplies and uniforms and facilities and food. Oh my gosh, the food that we give our athletes now is um, the dining, the dining facilities, and the the opportunity to get nutrition support, mental health support, um, all kinds of support services. Now, uh, operating budgets have exploded in in the last twenty to thirty years. So, um, you told me to cover one, and I just went through. I appreciate that. No, that's got me going. Well, um, yes. Yeah, so, so one of the things that I do in my role is to go through that list and make sure that we're we're complying. And I'm at the table when we're talking about building a new facility. We built the basketball facility, which was is now um, aging, but I was there when we when we built it, and just the conversation about square footage, office size. Um, meeting rooms, you know, everything had to be the same for the men and the women. And that's just not a conversation that that used to happen in the, in the early days. So um, really fortunate for me to be in, uh, in this era where we are doing things really well. And, um, and, but, but we always, you know, we always try to do, do more and do better for our, our all of our athletes. So they have a, a great experience. I want to touch base on role models as well, because I think that's such a critical area. Can I hit pause? Because I have a slide for that. Bigger part. Can we come back to that? No, because she's talking about coaches. You want me to okay. come back on nope, that? No, that's okay. Go ahead. I think I'll wait and come back on that. I, I do have I do have a um I do have a nice slide for that. Okay. Okay. Is All that right. that's okay? All right. Okay. We'll get there quickly. Oh, because I think seeing is, is believing, and so I do have some nice um, some nice stats from the Women's Sports Foundation. So okay. Um, when you were talking, Callie, I had had to chuckle a little bit because it reminded me of a story that I shared last summer when uh, beloved 
former football coach, Dan McCartney came back and all of his players had spearheaded a fundraising initiative to name the student athlete and letter winner engagement suite, which is where my office is. And it was to surprise him. Um, and we gave them full autonomy and really thinking through what they wanted in this event, which was really special. But one of the things that I shared during that time, because we had our celebration on the fourth floor of the Stark Performance Center, which is our dining hall reserved just for student athletes. It's the most beautiful area was that in preseason in 1999, when I came in, so I really had no idea what a preseason was. If we did not make it to Larch <laughs> dining hall for our training table before football, we did not eat anything except for bread and butter. <laughs> and so to think about the resources and the access and to be able to have my own experiences and see where they are today, you know, we aren't doing bake sales, which is very appreciated, um, <laughs> you know, and those things, but, but also um, it's been nice from an administrative perspective of how our student athletes don't take it for granted. And I do think that that has become something that's been important within our athletics department as facilities have increased, has, as support services have increased and how our student athletes have been able to benefit from the resources provided, but also their appreciation and gratefulness in how those have evolved. Um, there's still work to do, you know, there always will be. Uh, and I think that's important with the growing times, but, but I just thought it was funny because especially with, um, training table, that was one of those things that it was like, it didn't matter how sore you were. It didn't matter what hurt. If you did not make it over to training table, you did not eat. So <laughs> those are, I guess a, just a quick, quick follow-up. Um, we're in the process of doing exit interviews with all of our student athletes that are, that are departing and, uh, Without question, they have all said the new dining hall is a, a game changer and they're so appreciative and th that we are still interviewing those that know what we had before. And I said to one of them yesterday, I wonder when this is all they know, <laughs> will they really still appreciate it? Mm -hmm. So, you know, Elaine has talked about all of the change uh, during her time and I've seen a lot of change in my time, but the more you give them, Kind of the more the expectations um, rise, but but uh, we're meeting those challenges, and and I think that's and I know you're going to get to this too, but connecting the past to the mm -hmm. to the future so that today's athletes can hear these stories and and really appreciate what they have today and the and the hard work and the blood sweat and tears that went in by all these people to make it happen. Go for it. I think I'm on the right topic then. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, publicity. Well, we, when I first started here at Iowa State, our publicity was very, very limited. We had a student assistant, and our biggest deal was when we could compete off uh, off campus, we'd have to find a, set, a pay phone for that assistant to call in the score. I mean, that was huge, so we could at least call the score in. One of the bigger battles I had when we started here is to eliminate the qualifier women's basketball, women's softball. I said, don't we have men's basketball and women's basketball? And that was a huge step for us, not only within the athletic department, but in the public relations elements of Iowa State University. And now you even see it on television. And the growth has been huge. One of the battles I had here was with a Iowa State Daily Student Reporter. He called us the uh, the women cyclones, lady cyclones. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. I called him and I said, Grant, Grant, tell me, how do you tell the gender of a, of a cyclone? <laughs> Looked at me for the longest time. He uh, eventually came the next semester to work for us. And now he's the director of uh, communications at a major division one school. Delightful guy, but yet he could not tell me what the gender was. Now we've talked, we've grown tremendously. This is on the Washington Post, front page of their sport page. Unbelievable. Women's basketball. Complete coverage. And it was fabulous. So we have come so far. My only question being, if one of the men's programs had been in the final four, would Keith Murphy really had gone, gone and covered the Iowa Women's Basketball Championship? I don't think so. We still have work to do. Yes, I am. <laughs> um, 
one of the things is we do talk about media, women, uh, there are, let's see here, there are networks that are dedicated to showcase women's sports, which offers visibility. Um, at Iowa State, we had a third tier network before we went into the TV contracts and some of those things that were covered by cyclones.tv. And when I think about my own experience playing soccer, that was, there was no visibility. My parents were from Colorado. You know, they were having to drive out to be able to come see us play. Uh, and now you can turn on ESPN plus, which is an extension to the third tier networks at each of the schools that offer streaming devices. And so just kind of thinking through, or uh, maybe some of you guys have uh, some experiences. And I know we've talked, Ellen, a little bit of just how tuned in you are at different times, but just the access for and visibility that TV networks and media coverage has had in a positive way, um, but what you would maybe still like to see develop, if there's any thoughts. Well, I can I can talk about when I first got to I yeah, it's on. It's on. I can't control it. <laughs> um, when I got to Iowa State, uh, I remember we were struggling to get our women's games on the radio, and we needed. Um, it, we we had a station, but not all the games were on. And and as some of you probably remember, if you got just on the edge of town, you lost it. So it, the, the coverage was very very limited. Um, and then we look at um, the viewership of the women's final four this year, which I think um, there was a generational change in our industry this year, uh, thanks to a couple of amazing players. Uh, but the the coverage, you know, some guy that came to fix my um, cable a, a week ago or a couple of weeks ago said, Hey, are you going to watch the Iowa women's game this weekend? And, and I thought never in my life would this person have been paying attention to women's basketball. And to me, some of those things have happened recently where you kind of said, okay, we're, we're, we're getting pretty darn close. This is, this is really exciting. So um, I think our uh, ESPN is starting to figure it out. Uh, Lane and I were on the basketball committee together 25 years ago. Um, and they loved having women's basketball as part of their network, but they still didn't really seem to care that much. You, you, you know, they would put us on ESPN two and not on the, well, they still do that a little bit, um, put us on the, on a secondary channel and not the, not the main channel. So a few, a few things to do, but yeah, a lot of, a lot of progress in that area. I see this for both golf. I see a lot more coverage of women's golf. How does that look or, or how important is that to you? Well, the coverage just provides opportunity for young, young girls to see and experience and get excited about something and dedicate themselves to something. So it does everything in the world for for all women in all sports, young girls, reaching them soon. Ellen, do you have any additional thoughts of how? I always have. I know. But I, um, I just, I'm delighted that they're showing um, softball games. Uh, you know, it's like, I, I can't imagine playing softball on TV. That, that's like, so cool, but the, yeah, ESPN's coming through for us. So I, I, uh, I would like uh, um, maybe a little bit more um, space with the with the big conference or the conference games that we have now. The the um, the the attendance out there has been incredible. Oklahoma was like Packed. overflowing Plus. and and we ended up leaving because there there were, was no space to sit so i think that's great that they have got so much going on that um people are going home and watch it on espn plus <laughs> uh, also to to share some of the things that we do in at iowa state is color commentaries um, i've provided color commentary for soccer it's been really neat for me to be able to be involved and give back to my sport in that way. I know um, Allie, 
for softball. Oh, um, forgetting her last name. Capert. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Allie Capert. Uh, covers some of the co color commentary yeah. uh, for softball. And I think that it's just really fun to be able to get involved that way as well and provide that platform. Um, but let's move on to seeing is believing. So we talked a little bit about role models and how impactful people are to each of our stories, men and women. So I'll let you start, Elaine, as you are ready for this uh, topic. <laughs> right. uh, you have to see it to believe it. You have to see a role model in order to believe that you can become one. I know the Women's Sport Foundation, which is where much of this information has been pulled, states that 77% um, of female leaders who reported the lack of exposure to female coaches as role models limits girls' sports participation. Uh, I, I think what I really want to address is, yeah, it's been six generations of Title IX we have plenty of female qualified, capable females out there to be coaches. If you look at Stanford, South Carolina, Iowa, all women right across the board. Uh, as hard as it, for, as, as it is for me to say this, but you look at UConn. True, Gino is the head coach, but all of his assistants are all female. We've got to get back to that. Uh, here at Iowa State, a woman has a better chance of seeing that she can be president of the university than she can be a head coach. We only have two females as head women coaches. We have to be strong advocates across the board. We have to be aggressive in seeking women to coach women's programs. That, that takes a lot of time. Uh, for instance, Gilbert had a very successful women's volleyball coach. That position is now open. If you're a parent in Gilbert and you have a daughter who plays volleyball, you should be at that school board. You should be talking to the AD. Get us a strong female leader. Th th that's so important. We cannot stop advocating and become complacent to, well, there just aren't any qualified women out there. There are but you have to be aggressive and seek them. We have some female coaches here in the audience and they have been successful as role models. And that's what we need. You've got to see it to be it. That's how I feel. <laughs> um, breaking through barriers and overcoming adversity, achieving success and providing inspiration to others. What additional um, when we're thinking about role models, because we'll we'll step into mentors here in a second, because I think that there's a different role there. What additional things um, have you experienced or that would like to share? Well, I, I think related to what Elaine was saying, and um, those of us that have had had kids in youth sports, how many of your kids had a had a female as a youth sport coach? I mean, this is this is where it starts and it, it makes it very difficult as a collegiate administrator to, to find the women that we want to hire because my daughter never had a female coach, soccer, basketball, high school basketball, club basketball, they, they were all men. And so that's the, that's the training ground that we need. So I, I would say that that's really where the level is that we've got to start getting girls into it. I, I ran a soccer, uh, not soccer. I can't remember. I had a, I had a, a coaching vacancy a couple of years ago for a women's team. 93% of the applicants were male. Every applicant that I got, I went out and found and asked to be a candidate for the job, every single one. And so, uh, as Elaine said, there's a lot of work involved. And so we, we recruit and we, we recruit, but the, the, the pool isn't that great currently of women who want to coach and the demands of coaching and moving families. And, and we're, we're still getting a lot of those reasons why, why women won't come and, and take head coaching positions. So um, we're, we're getting there. My daughter was the 
only female to coach boys basketball in the state of Florida a couple of years ago. So, <laughs> so um, that was pretty, pretty cool. That was, um, that's what we need. We need, we need athletic directors at that level to say, Hey, you know, she played college basketball. She can teach these freshman boys how to play basketball just as well as anybody. So uh, we have a female track coach. Steve Lynn's daughter is mm -hmm. the head track yeah. coach for men and women at Ames High School. Yes. So every once in a while we make a dent. We mm -hmm. just have to keep at it and, and not become complacent. Well, I think that brings a good point too of, of really cultivating an environment where women are at the table and helping make decisions um, or being involved when something is uh, a conversation that you have expertise in, being able to help influence or bring additional perspective to that. And um, and mentors can play an important role and champions. Jan, you, you picked up the microphone. Did you have something to well, share? I was going to respond to Please do. Kelly's first point. Our daughter was on the varsity swim team here at Iowa State, I think about 1977. And she did have a woman coach. Uh, but that was about all that that team had. Uh, they worked out in Forker Building, that small pool. Some of you are familiar with it. And the diving team worked at one end while the swimmers were swimming laps. And so they had to adjust their swimming to swim, I think, on the two outer lanes while the divers were doing the in internal use of the pool. Um, also, at that time, there was no athletic, no counselors uh, to guide them. And uh, this was her first experience uh, in the U.S. because she had swam in the Philippines. Um, and there was a rule that you had to have 12 credits. Maybe that's still the, the stipulation. To be an athlete, you have to enroll in 12 credits. Well, she tested out of Spanish, and it was too late to add another class. So she did not meet the NCAA requirements and she was off the team. Mm. Oh. So that's an example when you don't have some of the yeah. uh, add-ons that are now common. That's a good point. I mean, the support services really are important. You think about education and, and all the degrees, uh, degree programs that have different requirements and we still see it today. It's complex. It's a lot more complex than maybe people realize. Um, but who are some of your mentors? Who are some of your champions? that helped you to get to where you are today? Well, one of my champions is here in the audience, and that's Reed Crawford, who was the Vice President for External Affairs here at Iowa State for a number of years. Always supportive, always there for me, sometimes too much, um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but really helped me and gave me that support. Uh, the Women's Committee here at Iowa State at that time was very, very strong. And when we had issues, when we had an athletic director who didn't think we needed to fund uh, summer school for the women because we really needed the men to have that money, uh, the Women's Committee stepped up and really became advocates for me in that, in that relationship. So uh, you have to have champions and you also have to have mentors. And uh, it makes a big difference in your life and in the life of that student athlete as well. I didn't have any any single person that I turned to. I, I always felt that um, I had this bigger group of people that I would turn to depending on what I needed help with. So I might call someone and say, "How did you manage that?" coaching search how did you how did you deal with the facility when it comes to equity how did you balance um raising your family with with the profession you're in so um that's where i think uh girls and women today really should reach out with with those proactive um uh, questions to people who have done it before and so rather than just one person that, that might be a mentor that, that maybe is good to guide you, I think, I think it's important to branch out uh, because every, we all have a different way of doing things. And so I think it's important to learn from a lot of folks. Well, that is a great segue into um, one of the areas that I'm very passionate about. So 
the student athlete development is one of my hats and letter winner engagement is another one of my hats and mm -hmm. connecting, uh, Kelly, you had said, you know, connecting the past and the present and the future, uh, we're doing that. And as we go into our kind of final piece to the panel here of recommendations and what can we do, what are some takeaways that we can have that we can influence or also help influence others that maybe have a platform, um, connecting people. Uh, so, gr so growing the sphere of influence, growing your network of people, um, reconnecting people. Uh, these are a couple pictures that Ellen is part of. Um, Lori is part of this in the audience as well. But uh, just thinking back to our softball program and how instrumental it has been with our pioneers. They named themselves very, no, very no, no, no. confidently. Oh, no, no. <laughs> trailblazers we've talked about pioneers and trailblazers but i love that you've embraced embraced uh just the road that you traveled and the connections that were made and you can see this last year we had a title nine reunion with Le the letter winners club that we welcomed back and celebrated all of our women in sport at iowa state and uh the picture on the left is that the left? Mm -hmm. okay um is in the same order as their team picture. And how many people were missing? Not too many from that group. There were uh, three missing uh, that have um, passed, um, but they had coaches, um, a scorekeeper, a trainer, and then I believe seven or nine players of the original um, softball team. Um, and uh, just a side note, the coach, which is the back row clear to the right, um, uh, she was a volunteer. They sucker punched her <laughs> into volunteering to coach their team. And she was great. And she has just the utmost respect by every one of those players still. It's wonderful to listen to them talk. But uh, they they came in second. They played two games um, in the state, won both of them, and then they uh, registered and went to the World Series in Omaha and came in second out there. And uh, they have in the picture, they have the trophy um, in there somewhere. I don't know if we ever found the trophy or not, but uh, it, yeah, they they uh, won. They lost to JFK, who had official uniforms. That was their um, the picture of their um, reversible shirts. <laughs> <laughs> and and as we have reunions, one of the things that has been a takeaway or an action item for us is connecting our former players with our current players and taking every opportunity where they get to see um, our women be successful in life and connect over industry, connect over opportunities that they've had in their life. Um, and we do this for both our men and our women. We do this across the board of connecting people. Um, and then I also have the privilege of teaching a couple classes at Iowa State. And our University Studies 303 program has um, evolved into connecting somebody one-on-one -on -one with a professional in an area of interest. And we prioritize having somebody that's connected uh, that was an athlete at Iowa State, if we can, um, just to be able to, again, open up those connections and connecting people uh, through being a cyclone. So that's one of the things that we've done. But I think that that model can happen in a lot of different places. Um, so just kind of recognizing some of those. And here were a couple pictures from the celebration that we had. Um, so every fall we do reunions uh, with the Letter Winners Club and they're all sport reunions. So they're opened to all student athletes, all former student athletes to come back and you can pick, you know, which weekend uh, in the past, when I first started, the last game was always reserved for football. And so then that meant people only had one choice of what weekend to come back for. And when we think about creating opportunities and we think about expanding um, access, people need to have options. And I think that's one of the areas that we can very directly influence is what options can we create in different environments for people to be able to choose to participate or have the choice to be able to attend. Um, and so for the on-field recognition, again, the left picture, um, those are our women's basketball players, current and former. And that celebration uh, on the field 
came together very last minute. I reached out to Kelly and asked if um, there would be support of being able to welcome our current female student athletes down to the field. And we ended up with at least 200 people on the field and we have time restraints and restrictions that you have to get on and off the field in a very con that concise amount of time that I was just glad when it was over, but we made it. We did not have any violations, um, but the, our women still talk about the opportunity of being on that field grouped in their sport and being able to connect between current and former. And those are some of the environments that um, have just been a joy for me in my professional career. That's been extremely successful here. And one of the happiest times I had here is when we invited back all the female student athletes who before I came had never had the opportunity to receive their letter. And we went back. It didn't matter if you came up and told me I played field hockey. I said, great. Congratulations. And we had five years of celebrating female athletes. And it was so special for so many of those women who had been, who got to be recognized and had that letter awarded to them by the athletic director. It was always attended by the president of the university. It's always attended by the uh, director of the alumni association, who I think saw a connection somehow about bringing people back on campus. But it, it was a wonderful experience, and uh, we're very, very happy that maybe that was a forerunner to all of the outstanding opportunities we now have to bring back our student athletes and reunite and relive many wonderful memories. Um, and I was one of those that did get my varsity letter in 1980, whenever it was, it still brings tears to my eyes. Uh, and as a community member, I love it when you bring people out onto the field and we can recognize, oh, well, she played basketball and oh, I see that football player over here. And it's a wonderful experience bringing in the community again to the athletic department and making it a big family because the community misses athletes once they leave as well and love to see them again when they return. I think about just how special this place is. And I think that's unique. We talk about it in our recruiting efforts too, is just the community of Ames is a really special place. And when you love the community, the community will love you back. And we talk about those kinds of developments as well. Jan, did you have something to share? Uh, I know at least one husband who is very proud when his wife got her letter. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, so as we kind of close in, just... Uh, some food for thought, and we'll open it up to some questions. Um, as we think about reflections and we think about really what's next, uh, you know, female athletes continue to be underserved um, in terms of promotional efforts. Um, NIL is a really hot topic right now. That's something um, that probably could take this entire panel time as one topic, uh, just because of how how much change is happening within the landscape of athletics. Um, and I don't know if there's anything that you'd even briefly want to share of, of NIL opportunities. And we think about education and workshops, but again, it probably goes back to access and opportunities, um, you know, of just creating some of those things. But it, NIL is um, name, image, and likeness. So the student athletes today have an opportunity of being able to earn money in exchange for their name, image, and likeness used in promotional materials or efforts. Um, things that we see in this area could be uh, trade, trade in kind, where you get your rent reduced or comped. Um, so there's some some big benefits that's new this year. We also think about cost of attendance and some just additional resources that are provided to student athletes. Yeah, it's, it it concerns me quite, quite frankly. NIL, um, and we've spent a, a wonderful couple hours talking about all the prog progress we've made with Title IX and. Um, NIL is not governed by any federal body, and so there's going to be no expectation of treat, e equitable treatment when it comes to NIL, and that that concerns me that we we have lost a little bit of control in, in that. And despite that, um, we we are upping our efforts to try to help our women get those same opportunities, even though. Um, we're not required by law to do that, but but I think that's how we've done things at Iowa State. We've done things because it's the right thing to do, not because the law said that we had to do it. So, um, but I, I I do have some concerns about that 
aspect of, of where we're headed. Um, as far as marketing and media, I mean, one, one thing that stood out to me this year is the Des Moines Register put a full set, full size bracket of the men's um, selection, the men's 64 teams, and did not put the women's bracket, despite the fact that it, there were three teams mm -hmm. um, from the state of Iowa playing in the in the national tournament. So tell talk to your local uh, sports writers because they like to be critical of us when they see something that might not be equitable, but we need them to give the coverage to the women so that so that we can capitalize on that too. So. And then you brought up a good point too, is not having some of the control with uh, the equitable treatment of offers or deals as they talk about. I mean, that really is something that the athletics department has no hand in. Um, they're not supposed to have any hand in. And that does, that really does take a step back because we know that that's not going to be equi equitable based on visibility um, and also revenue generating sports compared to Olympic sports and the access and opportunities are still work to be done there. Um, and we can all contribute to what that is, um, you know, by sharing our voice uh, and, and kind of a, the last slide that I have here is how can we, what can we do? Um, you know, attending women's sporting events, um, supporting women and women's athletics, listening, learning, and sharing. Those are all very basic, but they can still, contribute very widely to a positive outcome and um, being able to, as we've talked about throughout this entire uh, time together of just being able to share more and speak up um, when there are opportunities and providing that access. Are there any additional thoughts from our panelists? Just one. Surprise. Uh, we have to educate. We have to continue to educate people about Title IX and, and not lose sight of uh, what it provides. 87% of high school coaches have no idea what Title IX is. How can they convey that to their young people? How can they convey that to boys and girls as to what equity is if we're not educating? We, we should be educating our college co coaches, our uh, our student athletes at the universities, they need to know that all of this, they didn't just get inherit. There was a lot of hard work and there's still a lot of work to do. So education still must be uh, pursued. And the Women's Sports Foundation uh, recommendations, these are the page numbers. Um, so the QR code, and we can also make that available as a link in the chat. Um, if that's of help, but this goes to a really well done uh, executive summary and then also just at large efforts around Title IX um, and the advancements and also the recommendations. And so whatever role you potentially would have or know people, whether you're policymakers, whether you're um, coaching or education administrators, student athletes, parents and coaches or researchers, um, there are really well done recommendations of how we can continue to move the needle forward. Um, and this is a great resource to be able to do so, but we, we all have to be in it. And I think that's important as we continue to learn and grow. Well, thank you all for sharing your time with us as panelists. Um, what amazing women we have up here and let's just give them a round of applause. Sharing your wisdom. Questions. Yes, and we are happy to take some questions. We have a microphone. Yep. So we've got a few hands raised and we'll also entertain questions um, from our individuals on uh, online as well. Well, I'm supposed to hold it. Okay. Um, I, um, I just want to uh, thank the panel for being here today. I found it informative, educational, and an absolute um, pleasure. I've spent my life Adulthood pretty much around higher education. So thank you. I have a one question. Uh, well, actually two. Uh, one is um, baseball available to NCAA women uh, as an alternative or to to softball. And secondly, is Title IX going to cover trans athletes? Those are my two. Two questions. Um, <laughs> at, at the fact that we have softball theoretically suffices meeting the baseball issue. 
And as far as transgender, NCAA has addressed it and has uh, certain qualifications by sport as to whether or not a transgender may participate in that sport. Um, now, we do have a policy here in Iowa. They can't do anything. Right. And that's wrong. Uh, opportunities and competition should be available to everyone. But the, the NCAA has it, and they're in uh, alignment with the Olympic Committee as to who, as to what um, specific sport and what qualifications a transgender must meet in order to compete in that program. But we do have women's wrestling now. <laughs> Not at Iowa State, but that has now been offered as well. So th there's progress in many areas. Okay, my question is that I'm a little confused on some of the chronology. We're celebrating 50 years. You said it was about 75, 1975 when implementation really took effect. And when I was at Iowa State in the early 90s working in the foundation and, and Reed was around, and um, this was before Coach Finley, the women's basketball coach, Teresa Becker, had a, as her office over in State Gym something that had been um, slightly cleaned up from what had been a janitor's closet. It was just tiny and despicable. So we appealed to donors to make the addition on the east end of Hilton for Johnny Orr and the women's basketball coach and to make it equal. But that was in the 90s. And then you're talking about in 20 years ago when the new training facility was made, Everybody was on board by then to make equal space, equal allotment of everything. But why did it take so long? Why not in the last half of the 70s and the 80s? And, and let me tell you, it was not an easy sell on that addition to Hilton to say that the women's coach needed to come out of the state gym broom closet and get the same kind of facility as the male coach. Why, I mean, we were celebrating, but yet it took decades and decades. Well, now I have to correct you on a couple things. We first started in the ice hockey storage room for women's basketball. Uh, and all three coaches were in there. Before that, we were in we were on the other side of State Gym, where I had three coaches in the smallest office in, in that office complex, which was athletic. So With mice and rodents. Well, yeah. Um, they took up space. You're right. Uh, so we advanced from the ice hockey storage room, which I got in a lot of trouble for doing because I didn't ask permission. We then advanced to the uh, lower basement level with the sewer odor. And that's where we then advanced to for uh, the basketball coach. So see, we did make progress, Phils. Can I, I talk a little bit about the timeline? So um, the law, 1972, June of 1972, which is why we're celebrating this kind of 22, 23 uh, academic year, uh, was 37 words. Words? 37 words in Title IX said nothing about sports, nothing about athletics, nothing about recreation. It's not even mentioned in there. So everything that's happened has been through interpretations of the law. And I think initially institutions were given a six to eight year window to comply, but there were so many questions. What does compliance mean? And that's where the three part test came in about participation and meeting interests and abilities of, of, of the gender on campus and expanding your sports programs. But still, there's not a lot of specific information about, about what it is. Now, the 13 program areas that we talked about, that's where you start to say we need equitability, equ equ equitable locker rooms and office space and practice times and nutrition and support services. And so th th these are all kind of an evolution of that initial 37 words. And, and you could look at every institution across America and every single one would have a different kind of different level of compliance uh, with Title IX. So it's, it's, um, it's been subject to, to um, legal, you know, lawsuits have, have happened and those, those have forced certain changes, but um, that's the reason why there's still uh, it just didn't happen overnight, and it's continuing to to grow. So I, I hope that helps them. Because it wasn't the same when you played soccer as it is today. No. Wow. 
Yeah. No, it took a long time. I, I appreciate that. No, um, <laughs> I don't feel recent because I was talking to one of our recruits the other day and I said, well, I came in 1999. You probably weren't even born yet. Nope, they were not. <laughs> you know, so I've now re reached that threshold. Um, and when I came into Iowa State, it was the fourth year of the soccer program. So soccer was brought to Iowa State in 1995. The first competition year was in 1996. Kansas State just got their soccer program four or five years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that even in itself is an interesting evolution. Um, and also how sports differ across conferences, across schools within the same conference and, and so forth. Um, so there were times where we would have travel partners and we would maybe be paired up with a, a school in Texas, for example. Well, the amount of travel that would take place would be very disruptive even to your um, academic schedules and those kinds of things. So it's just, it is interesting to see how things have evolved. Um, we're going backwards a little bit in my opinion with how far we have to travel. Um, but that's also the way that our conferences are, are growing um, and TV contracts also change that a little bit. Um, but there's always going to be advancements and I think there's always going to be milestones that we can celebrate along the way of recognizing um, but that what what worked well at one point in time maybe isn't going to continue to working work well or work the same. Um, and I've seen that just even within the last 20 years. Uh, my name is Helen Gunderson. I live in Ames. Uh, this may seem a little bit drawn up. I wasn't going to mention this, but the talk of the uh, office space for the basketball program as much as I'm excited about Iowa State's women's success in basketball and realize that Bill Fenley made a commitment to a career commitment at an early age to be in women's sports, I think speaks highly of him. But I do not like the interpretation that he came along to what seemed like a really failing program. And that was due to his <laughs> being a god or or being so successful that made the change because I think that there were competent women in that era before him. And I suspect that at some point the university made a point to get behind women's basketball more. Uh, that said, my background is I did work in sports information at North Dakota State University in the 70s, uh, went there in 75, and it took the university a while to get behind women's sports. Um, I remember uh, calling in sports scores and the women's report might get in the paper on the women's page in the women's section. And, uh, but uh, I came here in 1963 to Iowa State and majored in physical education for women. Uh, Byer Hall had been built for the men. Uh, the women were in the women's gym. Um, I was on the ISU rifle team and the ISU women's rifle team, the ISU fencing team. Uh, not very sophisticated, but at least it was an opportunity. But some of my heroes over the years have been, uh, even though she was a strong-willed, powerful force and dominated in very many ways, was Barbara Forker. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then over the years, I would hear of Elaine Heber, and I would I know other people that took leadership positions, and I respected them because of their dignity, their vision, and their ability to cooperate in the trenches. I think the, part of the unfortunate thing was that the men's program was on one side of campus and emphasized sports. The women's program was on the other side of campus and emphasized education. Uh, we did take one or two courses together, such as the hygiene course from Ray Bickerstaff, the men's football uh, athletic trainer. It was a joke of a course. Uh, um, uh, but um, I, I know there were women over the years involved, even before AIAW, but into that, that built a program and it seems to me that the NCAA, it wasn't only Title IX that made a difference. It was that the NCAA started seeing that the women's tournaments 
sponsored by women who were not highly paid and uh, working far beyond the call of duty of their job descriptions, they had made tournaments that can make money. And uh, there were times when I think the North Central Conference that NDSU was in, and even maybe the Big Eight Conference and the NCAA just did not want anything to do with women's sports. I guess the, the last area I want to address is that as an undergraduate in physical education, by the way, we learned to teach the five player full court basketball rules. Um, anyway, the, the philosophy, we, we had a course in philosophy of physical education and sport. And the idea was on participation, not spectator sports. Uh, and uh, the idea was that this was in the women's side of the campus now. The emphasis was on building a curricular program, you know, a strong classroom program, building a strong intramural program. And then over that would be the uh, interscholastic sports, such as play days and sports days. And then uh, build on top of that um, your other things. And, and with AIAW, there were rules against um, you, you could get maybe an English scholarship or a science or social studies scholarship, but there were not scholarships for sports per se. Uh, women coaches or could not travel across the country to recruit. I think students may have been able to come to campus for a visit, um, but, uh, and of course, there were probably bags of lunch that you pick up in the morning from the cafeteria if you were going to go on a, a road trip. Um, anyway, uh, I, I don't follow sports very much because of what has become uh, so commercialized. I did really get caught up in following Caitlin Clark and the University of Iowa, and I'm really proud to see Lucy Luter in such a leadership capacity. But I'm, I'm concerned about at what point are we into this crazy world of it's no longer university student participation on a on a amateur level and at what point is this nil completely wrong and at what point is the transfer portal totally wrong and is the horse out of the barn and i i don't think any of you probably have answers to this but i hope some of you your heart aches too when you see what's happening because I think it'd probably be better for me out to go out for a walk or do something like that than be watching Caitlin Clark on TV as beautiful as she is to watch. I'd rather uh, I'd rather be participating more. So <laughs> thank you for your comments. I think it's there's certainly, I think everybody up here and probably several of you can feel similar in some of the the changes, especially with NIL and transfer portal. I mean, that definitely has made more experiences complex. Um, I've seen the good and I've seen the bad of NIL, um, just working directly with student athletes. Um, it's tricky still. And I think we're all trying to figure some of that out. But thank you for your comments. And how do you think the uh, like large coverage of women's basketball will uh, more and more professionalize uh, sports at the collegiate level? I mean, I see it in some ways, and it's moving down to the high school too, I think. And, and sometimes I question whether the, this may sound contrary. Can you grab your microphone? The uh, heavy coverage of sports in media, is it all positive or are they negative? I think I think of those who do not make the teams, for example. We're talking about elite teams, but there are so many students who do not make the 12 member team or the 36 member team. And so when we look at everything in society, um, is it all positive? That's kind of negative, but I think overall, how is sport going to affect 
the growth of our youth. I remember years ago, uh, there was a very good uh, research project, a survey, looking at the number of uh, girls who did not continue sports beyond, I believe it was the age of 14. And the most cited thing was it was too, too hard. They dropped out and uh, they felt they weren't achieving their goals. And so when we think of sports, it's a very elite group today. And um, there's the whole society that also needs uh, attention. Uh, sorry to say this, but uh, it's, it's a fact, I think. And I remember years ago, I was invited to a local school, Hamilton, which had had a, a, a state girls basketball championship. And uh, they invited the players from that team to come back and play. And it was extremely entertaining to see 40-year-olds <laughs> trying to play like 17-year-olds. And, and they were so out of shape. It was really sad. And I thought, <laughs> I wondered if they could walk the next day. But um, lifelong activity should be a goal for everyone. And I hope that in addition to the elite athletes, we are also emphasizing that in our education program. Yes, yeah, thank you. A follow up comment uh, on my end. When I was in high school, we had intramural sports. Yeah. Intramural sports, that's, that existed before yeah. the teams, for, for girls anyway. Uh, I think we need to make sure we still have strong intramural programs because as Jan said, there are only a certain number of people that make the team. What about the others that still like sport, enjoy that sport, need that sport, find health, lifelong health and social benefits from sport? We've kind of given up on that part of our history. It's disappearing from high schools. I don't have any high school age children or know of any, <laughs> but uh, if, if you have a reach into your schools, uh, I, I think high schools, it's so imperative that they have money for intramural programs for boys and for girls, I think it's usually important. And I think it's also important to just recognize the personal touch of inviting kids out. Uh, my youngest was invited by a coach to, a, to try wrestling for the first time, and he fell in love with it. And he would have never tried it if he didn't have that personal touch from a coach. And so just inspiring and, and encouraging can go a long way as well. I think there was another hand up, maybe or a couple more questions, and it's right at four o'clock. So we'll go ahead and wrap up with any final questions or anything online. Nothing online, okay? Yeah, right over here. Yeah, <laughs> we'll get one to you. Hey, thanks so much. Appreciate you all spending some time here. My question is about. Um, Kind of the bad rap for Title IX and dropping of men's sports. I think, mm -hmm. you know, you would have been here at Iowa State when some men's sports were dropped. And so I would just be curious. I have my opinion of why, why there isn't enough money to support all these programs, but I'd be curious, you know, Elaine and Callie, specifically Lindsay, you too, about, mm -hmm. you know, how do you um, try to help dispel some of those myths and what can athletics departments do moving forward? Um, so really I guess just question. with messaging and so there is participation for as many folks as possible. It's a really good question. Well, well, they do get a bad rap that, and that's the biggest fear when, when I came along is great. Now they're going to take some money away from my sport in order to have this women's sport. Uh, I don't think there's a reason why you can't fund these programs. There's absolutely none actually. It's a matter of reallocating funds, and, and that's a tough decision to make. But do you really need 30 assistant coaches and uh, quality control and an assistant quality control coach and an intern for the quality control coach? No, you don't. You reallocate. And I always tried to pull it with, you know, if you have a baby that, and you're, it's a baby boy and you put all your resources into that little child to help him. Oh, then you've got a baby girl. 
Do you say, honey, I'm sorry, but the son got all the money? No, you reallocate. If, if you look at what happened at Iowa, they dropped women swimming because they just didn't have enough money. Well, Title IX came in and proved to them that yes, you do have enough money. It was a matter of reallocating monies, making a decision that we didn't need 15 different uniforms for basketball. Maybe we could get by with 13. Um, it's a reallocation of funds. Not only did they bring women swimming back, but they added women's wrestling. And it took quite a while. Dan Gable was one of the biggest opponents of Title IX that was going to ruin men's athletics. And he fought Title IX every chance he could mm -hmm. until all of a sudden he saw women's wrestling coming on board. Oh, it opened up a whole new avenue of opportunities to re-excite people about wrestling for men and for women. So... I don't think there's a good reason for dropping sport. It's a very difficult decision and it's a very hard decision. Uh, I think it's a reallocation of fundings and doing perhaps doing without for a couple of years, but I, I have a hard time dropping programs. Thanks for the question, Molly. It's, uh, it's a really good question because I do think Title IX has been unfairly blamed for those. And as Elaine said, it's a, it's a financial decision and it's not a, it's not a, a women's decision. So um, I think this platform and educating others about the reasons um, that that happens is really, really important um, to not make women the enemy of, of the men who may have had a sport dropped. But, but as Elaine said, there's, there's resources that are going into other men's programs and you can, you can make different decisions about what you do. And fortunately, I've never been Part of a, a sport having to be dropped. So I haven't had to deal with that um, publicity, but uh, it's about the message and not blaming Title IX for it. Um, it just seems to me that part of the argument was the football players earn the money. They're the breadwinning home. Or <laughs> they make all this money, they should be able to spend it on themselves. I mean, that's pretty long ago. But the thing is, they don't make it their players. They're using university facilities and all sorts of other things, and university loyalty. And it just seemed to me that idea that they could pawn the money for themselves and, and not have to share it uh, was maddening. Well, 90% of men's football division one break even. They don't make money. Yes. They, they spend what they make. Yeah, and really, any program can make money. You can generate revenue in any program. All you have to do is charge admission. You might get 10 people coming, but it's a revenue-producing program that way. It's a hard argument. Well, the, mo the money is in touch. I may have misspoken, but I mean, you know, you're absolutely right. You know, the, whether they made money or not, they made money for themselves. They didn't make it for the Right. Well, the money is in television and the television contracts are around football. So that, that's, that's the, that's the link, right? You, you've got these big television contracts and bowl contracts and, um, and those are mostly about football I and mean, men's basketball doesn't even really make the money that, that football does, but we do all live off of what we make from football. I mean, that's just the reality of, of um, the, the financial situation so but um, it's the increasing control of what happens by television coverage say can you say that again how do you see the ncaa affecting the future of sport in wow. terms of control that's a that's a loaded <laughs> question <laughs> but i'd like to hear your answer yeah <laughs> Well, the NCA is really struggling right now with what their role is, yeah. and there's not a lot happening in compliance, and there's a lot happening with this conference realignments and the shift of resources, and um, I, I think the NCA probably sees their role diminishing in this all of this alignment and the the power maybe being more in the conference in the conferences, but. Um, you know, there's there's a lot happening in our industry, and I'm I'm not 
I have no crystal ball about where it's all headed, but um, I think that's a great question. I think um, no one really knows the answer to that right now. One, one, one quick question, NIL. Should that be public information or not? If Ooh. universities publish uh, faculty and coaches' salaries, should NIL be public information? It's not university money. Mm -hmm. It's private. But it's related to the it's related to the university. But students also have privacy. Yeah. It's it's the students, it's not um, the athletic department setting it up. The athletics is un yeah, involved we're, legally. We're supposed to stay out of it, but you know, not everybody is, but we're we're following it. I think it's opens up yeah. a big yeah, it does. It does. Okay, we're gonna wrap up. We it's uh this has been so wonderful, and I and I wish we did have a little bit more time, but um, but I think that one of the takeaways for me too is that there's more conversation to be had, and what a wonderful opportunity, right, to be able to continue these conversations. So thank you all for joining us in person. Thank you for those that stuck with us online. Um, thank you, Susan, for helping to coordinate all of the details here, and to all of the sponsors for this program. Um, it will be made available electronically on the YouTube channel as well. And I believe that you can find that on the library's resource page. Yes, that, okay. it'll be about a week. It'll be about a week. Um, I want to say this, but thank you, Lindsay, yeah, for your work in preparation and your leading this here. discussion. Of course. Oh, thank sorry. you. My, My pleasure. Thank you. I mean, great things happening in our department um, in Lindsay's area. So thank she's, you. she's doing a great job. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you all. Have a good day.